Welcome back to Questing Beast. I am Ben. Today we're taking a look at a feature of the OSR playstyle that I think is extremely central to it, and that is OSR style challenges. The blog post we'll be looking at is by Goblin Punch, one of my favorite blogs. Links are down in the description below. And it really looks at the way that OSR style games approach problems in an adventure. The principles in this blog post completely rewired my brain as to how I thought about the kinds of situations I should create for players. And I think it's led to a lot better adventure building on my part. So for example, my adventure, The Waking of Willoughby Hall is built around these principles. And I think that's why people have responded to it so well. Now, the title of this blog post is OSR Style Challenges, Rulings Not Rules is Insufficient. But before we take a look at that, we have to take a step back and look at what does rulings not rules mean? Now, the actual origin of that phrase has a whole bunch of different possible origins, but I think the place where most people have heard it is in Matt Finch's document, A Quick Primer for Old School Gaming. In that document, he describes it like this. Most of the time in old school gaming, you don't use a rule, you make a ruling. Uh, the players can describe any action without needing to look at a character sheet to see if they can do it. The referee in turn uses common sense to decide what happens or rolls a die if they think there's some random element involved and the game moves on. This is why characters have so few numbers on the character sheet and why they have so few specified abilities. Many of the things that are die roll challenges in modern gaming, disarming a trap, for example, are handled by observation, thinking, and experimentation in old style games. Getting through obstacles is more hands-on than you're probably used to. Rules are a resource for the referee, not for the players. Players use observation and description as their tools and resources. Rules are for the referee only. Matt Finch then goes on to give a number of concrete examples of how this principle works in practice. Strongly recommend that you read it. In fact, read the whole primer. It was really good and really influential on me. However, Goblin Punch's article, which we're gonna look at today, was really useful in expanding on that concept and showing how just saying rulings not rules doesn't get you all the way there. It's important to add elements to the adventure, to the campaign itself, that make that principle more fun to play out. As he points out here, rulings not rules is merely a description of the system, which is only a small chunk of what actually contributes to gameplay. Because you have the system, but you also have the adventure, the DM, and the players, and really all of those things should work together to make rulings not rules sing. But firstly, looking at the system level, he says that you do need to have an incomplete system. You need to have room for rulings, and that means there have to be gaps between the rules. Uh, if a player is familiar with a game system, they'll think back to how they want to use the rules as a first resort. For an example of a more complete skill system, all you need to do is look at the skill descriptions from the 3.5 edition. The more complete a rule set is, the more tempting and valid it is to say, well, it's not covered in the rules, so you can't do it. Or even worse, this is covered in the rules, and if we add up all the situational modifiers, you will do so at a minus 14 penalty, even though I personally agree that this task shouldn't be that difficult. Next, he says that you also need a system that supports rulings. So first, the system can't have too much interdependence between the moving pieces. Some mechanics are isolated, like XP, while others touch on many other mechanics, like ability scores. The more interconnected a mechanic is, the more knock-on effects you'll have when you modify it. If you want to make just a quick ruling and get on with your game, you usually want to make sure that your quick ruling won't have any unforeseen consequences. Second, the system needs to have a simple way to adjudicate rulings. My first resort is just to ask the players to roll under the most relevant ability score. If it doesn't seem tied to any particular aspect of the character, then I usually just ask for an X in six roll, which I make up on the spot. Bad rulings are ones that are slow or confusing, but the worst rulings are the ones that are ultimately unsatisfying in the sense that they don't give results or chances of results that mesh with the player's expectations of how the world works. Just as players use common sense to come up with stuff that requires a ruling, use common sense to make rulings as opposed to precedent or some other analogous rule you saw somewhere else. Now, I've always been of the opinion that most modern role-playing games, even ones that aren't D&D, &D, can be run in an old school style. But I think the Goblin Punch is right here that the system is helpful in assisting with that and making that a lot easier to do. If you're playing a system that has a very crunchy and involved set of rules, you're going to have to train your players to not rely on those so much and instead to think in world. You can certainly do it, but it's a lot easier if their character sheet hardly has any mechanics on it. As for the second point about making sure that the system allows for you to make simple intuitive rulings, I feel like that's applicable to pretty much all role-playing games because you can easily import just percentage rolls or D6 rolls into anything you want. Just give a chance of it happening and roll to see if it happens. Now, the next section of the article is I think the real meat of it, where we get to how to create situations and how to set up adventures that support this style of play. But first, a quick shout out to today's sponsor. This video is sponsored by our longtime partner, Into the AM. You may have noticed that I'm often wearing their t-shirts in my videos, and that is because they are so 
comfortable. Seriously, I have never had t-shirts that have felt this good for this long. I'm still wearing t-shirts from the early days of them sponsoring the channel all of those years ago. You also don't have to break the bank in order to get some of their great designs. From March 15th to 19th, they're gonna be having a clearance sale where everything is 30 to 80% off, so mark your calendars. And as usual, if you use my link in the description below, you can get an extra 10% off of their entire web store. All right, so how do you support the rulings not rules principle at the adventure level? Well, what you do is you give players problems that can only be solved with innovation. Here's some examples. There's a circle of mushrooms with a girl inside it. Everything inside the circle of mushrooms will do everything in their power to get more people inside the circle. No save. The girl is already in their thrall. Or perhaps uh, there's a bowl built into the ground. It's lined with gold, but full of acid. Or this fairy tale classic, the bad guy cannot be hurt by any weapon forged by mortal hands. As a side note, I've noticed that fairy tale and mythology frequently contain great examples of these types of problems. I wrote a blog post a little while back about how the labors of Hercules from Greek mythology has some really good examples where the king is always giving Hercules these problems to overcome that he cannot simply overcome with brute strength. So how do you come up with these types of problems on your own? Well, Goblin Punch gives us some principles. An OSR style problem has to have no easy solution, many difficult solutions, requires no special tools like unique spells or plot devices, can be solved with common sense as opposed to system knowledge or setting lore, and isn't solvable through some ability someone has on their character sheet, or at least isn't preferentially solvable. I'm okay with players attacking the Sphinx, a risky undertaking, if they can't figure out the riddle, because risky but obvious can be a solution too. While I was working on the adventure for Jim Henson's Labyrinth, the adventure game, I relied on these principles a lot. For example, I would have a stretch of hallway where if you walked down it, you would immediately fall over asleep. How are you going to get past this area when everyone who walks through here falls asleep? You're going to have to think about it a little bit. It doesn't have to be difficult, but some thinking will have to be involved, which also fits with the theme of the movie. I've heard people call this principle create problems without solutions. Not that there shouldn't be any solution to the problem, it's just that you don't have to think of it yourself. That's really up to the players to do. You can, if you want to, create little things that could help with solving the problem and scatter them through the adventure, although oftentimes that's not really necessary. For me, as a game master, watching players find a way to bypass these OSR style problems is the most enjoyable part of the game. I just love seeing that problem solving at work, and I love seeing the crazy solutions that they come up with. Goblin Punch actually has a supplemental blog post he did a little while later called 1D 124 OSR Style Challenges. This was crowdsourced on Google Plus back when that was in operation, and there's tons of great ideas here. I mean, it was crowdsourced, so some are better than others, but it's really a cornucopia of things to steal from. But there's another thing that you should give players besides OSR Style Problems, and that's OSR Style Tools. So anti-examples of this is going to be a sword of plus one or a cloak that gives you plus four to stealth. Anything that gives you a numeric bonus is not an OSR style tool. What you want are tools that allow for innovative problem solving. They stretch the brain. Good examples include immovable rod, polyjuice potion, a love potion, psychic paper, sovereign glue, bag of infinite rats, that sort of thing. If you want lots of examples of these sorts of tools to steal, then of course Goblin Punch has a list of 100 of them on another blog post, and Chris McDowell from Into the Odd also has a list of 100 of them to steal. A good OSR style tool is a tool that does one weird, highly specific thing that is only going to be useful in, you think, pretty narrow circumstances, but players are going to find ways to make it useful in others. You can definitely see this principle at play in my Knave role-playing game, where I have a list of 100 spells that don't do any damage. They all just do one weird thing, and players are going to get creative with making them useful. I also created a lot of these types of tools in my Waking of Willoughby Hall adventure. For example, a mirror that only reflects what happened years in the past. If OSR problems are problems without solutions, then OSR tools are solutions without problems. The player's job is going to be connecting those two things together in ways that they think will work. Goblin Punch also mentions a number of things that you can do to help make rulings not rules work better on a DM level and on a player level. So for example, talk to your players like they're adults. Tell them that this game will have problems that aren't obviously solvable and that some of the problems will have solutions that aren't on the character sheet. Second, you need to reward creativity when you see it. This is super important, I've discovered. When players ask you if something is possible, say yes. When you are devising a rule for some ridiculous player shenanigans, lean in the player's favor. Now, this doesn't mean that you should just let players do whatever they want if it's impossible. If it really doesn't make any sense, then it doesn't make any sense and it shouldn't work. But if it's pretty plausible, if they put work into making this work and making a good case for it, 
I usually just let it slide. I want to encourage that and make that fun for the players. Now, as far as advice for the players goes, he says, think about all of your resources at your disposal, including stuff in other rooms, take notes, make the hirelings do it, see if any of your magic items do cool stuff in combination, uh, take it to someone who knows more about it. If it looks like it might do something horrible, pick it up on the way out, come back later with the right tool, experiment, ask the DM lots of questions. This is really big. If you're a player, you want to get information so you can do stuff. And finally, before you touch the dangerous parts, learn as much as you can about the non-dangerous parts. So that's Goblin Punch's take on the rulings, not rules principle. I find the, the principles, especially about creating OSR tools and OSR situations or OSR problems to be the critical parts of this article. If you implement those in your D&D adventures, I think it'll make them much better if you like that creative player problem solving aspect. I will, of course, put links to where you can find all of these resources down in the description below. And if you have ever come up with a great OSR tool or an OSR problem, please leave that in the comments. I love reading about them, and it could be a good resource for other players who are new to this style of play. All right, thanks for watching, everybody. I'll see you next time.